All right, we want to greet everyone. We want to greet everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we're grateful to the Lord for everyone that's here. And today, if the Lord will, we're going to cover a few things. Uh, my prayer is that we will be helped by what the Lord says to us. One of the things that's uh, disappointing uh, to me um, is the word being preached and uh, but people not following what it says and what happens over time um, is people begin to see the fruit of not following the word now my prayer is that we will all understand that whenever the Lord preaches to us uh, he's saying it for a reason the things that he says is, is for us to abide by it's not uh, just a good message, you know, to encourage us. It's, it's meant to change our lives. The things that are being preached are meant to change our lives. And what happens is people, maybe they've just gotten used to going to churches, I guess, or just not taking heed to uh, things that they hear. But I can promise you, when you uh, hear God's word and you don't apply it, you're going to see the fruit of that disobedience in your life. And it's going to ultimately, um, you'll get bitter, you'll get angry, you'll be mad because something's not going right. And the whole time, you have the tools that you need um, to live a victorious life. So it's important that we apply God's word when we hear it, that uh, these things aren't meant to be taken lightly. You see, they aren't meant to be taken lightly. So we're going to go look at a story, and we're going to um, um, see what the Lord has to say to us. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the 10th chapter of the book of Second Sam Samuel. I'm sorry, the 11th chapter of the book of Second Samuel. The 11th chapter of uh, 2 Samuel. And we're going to read this chapter. And if the Lord say the same, we're going to uh, help us. The Lord is going to help us to see uh, exactly what it is that he wants us to see in this chapter. And my prayer is that we will apply it, uh, these things to our lives. So the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel, we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the, uh, at the time when kings, now pay attention very closely to what we're saying now, what, what, what you're reading here. At the time when kings go forth to battle. Everybody see that? Let me read that again. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab. Everybody see? <laughs> Did everybody hear what was just said? Was Joab the king? David did what? He sent Joab. All right? And his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbi. But David, but, everybody see that? What did he do? He tarried still where? Isn't that something? Let's read verse 2 now. That sets the stage for the rest of this. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw who? A woman. And what was she doing? Taking a bath. Hence the name Bathsheba. And the woman was very what? That's two strikes. He already had wondering eyes. <laughs> it didn't help that she was pretty. 
And the woman was very beautiful. Everybody see that? Not okay, not so-so, not I'll marry her. I guess she'll do. And she was very beautiful to look upon. Everybody see that? Now, you have to pay attention to the words now. It didn't just say she was very beautiful. She was very beautiful to look upon. In other words, she, this was the, the type of woman that turned heads. Okay? Now, where was David supposed to be? <laughs> I'm showing you when you disobey in one thing, it opens up the door for all kind of other stuff. Most of us adults in here, we have a story we can tell. If I hadn't been at this place, I would not have gotten into this. If I would have been where I was supposed to be. Now, if we don't have that story, we got one. Let's go find it. <laughs> Everybody understand? No, it's not. He shouldn't have took out his gun and shot me in the behind. I shouldn't have been there. Everybody understand? Man, people always shooting up in the club. I'd be glad, be glad when the club gets saved. Or <laughs> you can stop going to the club. Everybody see? And be what you, where you're supposed to be. Everybody see that? So you see how God's design is. It ain't that big of a deal. After all, Joab and them, they did what they were supposed to do. They conquered the army. They, they, you know, they conquered that place where they were supposed to. So everybody see that? And you could think, you can overlook stuff like, well, it, it, at least the job got done. It's not, in other words, it's harmless. Me being at home, you know, I'm big bad David, and, I'm, and my general Joab, he's more mightier than I am. He's, he's just as rough and rugged as I am. He'll get it done. What does that matter? If you're not in the place where you're supposed to be, doesn't matter what Joab did. What are you doing on top of the roof, David? You see the setup? You think he had in his mind when he, when he skipped out on going to war? Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to just stay home and, and look at another man's wife. No, that wasn't on his mind. But I guarantee you it was on the devil's mind. You don't have to see the devil. Just obey God. Everybody understand? So you see how the door opened there. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 3, And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Does everybody see that? Now let me just share something with you. We, we, sometimes we pray a prayer as if we're obedient. If, if we pray that prayer, we better make sure we're obedient. The prayer should have been, Lord, help me to do everything I'm supposed to do in you. Help me to go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do. Not, Lord, help me to overcome adulterous eyes. Because if you're in God's will and you're where you're supposed to be and doing what you're supposed to do, automatically adulterous eyes, that don't apply to you. So everything that we're going to read after this is something that David could not help. Once he disobeyed God's order and stayed home from war, he was in the devil's grip and he could not help himself after that. Everybody understand? That's the trap. When you disobey God at the door, the whole house belongs to the devil. Does everybody understand? So don't, don't you, and, and, and let me just bring it down to where we can really understand it. The way you get over all your past hurts and all these past relationships is not by writing down everything somebody done to you and replanting in your mind and writing them a letter saying, I forgive you for this, I forgive you for calling me names, I forgive you. No, ask the Lord to forgive you for getting in a relationship to begin with. Ask the Lord to forgive you for going to the place where you met the person to begin with. 
You got to start from the door. Does everybody understand? The door was David being disobedient and not being where he was supposed to be. He put his responsibilities on another man. And after that, it was just, it was all, that was all the devil needed. You disobey an order? Well, good. I got you from here on out. And before you come to yourself, you're going to have a whole lot of marks on your name that people thousands of years from now are going to be talking about. Everybody see how the devil operates now? So you disobey at the door, that, then the devil has you. Your house becomes his. Everybody understand? All right, let's go and keep reading. And David sent messengers and what? And took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived, and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Now, can you see the setup here? And, and that was all the message. It wasn't, well, you know, it, it, could between, it could be between you and Uriah. No, Uriah was off doing what he was supposed to do. Everybody understand? So there was no doubt in David's mind he was the daddy. He didn't have to ask for a test, none of that. Everybody understand? Everybody see? I'm going to tell you something about the devil. When he sets you up, it is clean. Everybody understand what I mean when I say clean? Bathsheba wasn't a whore. She wasn't out there sleeping with all kind of different men and you know, bringing five of them to paternity court. When the devil sets you up, it is clean. We the ones living raggedy lives and all over the place and don't know what and what. But when the devil sets you up, it's no doubt in your mind and his. This is clean. This is you. This is clean. Everybody understand? When he stack evidence, it's pure evidence. According to your will. Everybody understand? All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 6, And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. Everybody understand what they're saying there? David told Uriah, come on, you know, sent a message to tell Uriah, get back here to this place. In other words, let me call you out of the place you're supposed to be at. Does everybody see? Now, do you see how David's working for the devil now? Uriah was an honorable man. He, he didn't mind being away from his wife and on the battlefield. He was where he was supposed to be. That's what I'm saying. Evil communication corrupt good manners. When David refused to go to war, the only thing he could do was call people away from that war. So now he's working for the devil. I'm not only out of God's will, I'm going to get you out of God's will. Come on home. And let me trick you, and see, this is the way of the world. Let me trick you. I'm going to send you home with all this food. You and your wife, y'all going to get full off this food. Then y'all going to have sex, and you're going to think that's your baby. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 9. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. 
See how honorable he was? All of the army of Israel is sleeping in tents or out in the open in this war. I, there's no way in the world I'm going to go home and sleep in my comfortable bed and sleep with my wife and eat good food. No way. Could you imagine how that must have pricked David's heart? Well, I stayed home. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. <laughs> ain't nothing. That's your wife. It ain't nothing wrong with that. Everybody understand? <laughs> but when, you know, people can talk past that. And David said to Uriah, tarry here today also and tomorrow, and I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him what? Drunk. And at evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the service of his Lord, but went not down to his house. You see that again now. I'm going to get him drunk. He ain't going to be able to help himself but go to his house. But again, he did not. Why? Because when the devil set you up, it is clean. He's got to be able to present a valid case before the Lord. If he's going to stand before God and accuse you, it's got to be valid. He can't lie on you because God knows a lie. Everybody understand? He knows God can't judge his lie on you. So he's got to tell the truth. So in that Uriah still. Now listen, and this is the thing. The devil is, trying, is using David to pull Uriah this way. But the Holy Spirit is telling Uriah, no. Even being drunk, don't you go to your wife. We're going to make sure King David get what's coming to him. Everybody see? <laughs> and it came to pass, verse 14, and it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. You see how, just do what you're supposed to do. This is a lot of work. <laughs> Everybody understand? I tell you, being disobedient, that's a lot of work. Cheating, and that, that's a lot of work. Everybody understand? Yeah, it's a lot of work to cheat. You got to make up all kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going shopping for some of those toe socks or whatever. I'm, you know, I might be gone a few hours, you know. It's, it's, just, it's just, it ain't worth it. Sin is a lot of work. Sin all together. That, and this is and sin will wear you out. <laughs> People that have been living in sin for 40, 50 years, they look 60 and 70. Everybody understand? <laughs> yeah, sin will wear you out. So David, and then it, you know, he's coming up with all these ideas. Now that's the frustration of sin and disobedience. The devil will give you ideas that will never work. He's giving them to you, but he knows there's, not gonna, there's nowhere in the world you're going to override God in this matter. You don't know it. But I'm going to keep giving you excuses. I'm going to keep giving you little ideas, little ways to work around, and little loopholes you can find in God's word. In your mind. Everybody see? Let's go ahead and keep reading. And he wrote, verse 15, and he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. Everybody see that? So he sent Joab a ladder, set him in the hottest part of the battle, and then you move away from him. Don't protect him. Don't watch his back. Isn't that something? Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 16. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. 
And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approach ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight, knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote, who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerebesheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of a millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So everybody see what happened here. In this war, when it was, you know, given the order, set Uriah in the heat of the battle, they lost that battle. And Joab knew that well, King David might be mad because we lost the battle. But if he gets mad, tell him Uriah is dead. That's going to cheer him up. Because, see, King David wasn't used to losing. Everybody understand? So, so can you see what's going on here? It wasn't meant for them to lose this battle. But when you ride the wave of the devil, there's no way you can win. Everybody understand? Let's go and keep reading. Verse 22, so the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, surely the men prevailed against us. We lost. And came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. And thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease, displease thee. For the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. Everybody see that? It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, a whole bunch of other men died, but at least Uriah was one of them. Encourage, everybody see what's going on here. Joab was sad about it. We lost this battle, not David, because I'm winning behind the scenes. Now, at least, I'm not going to have to answer for getting this man's wife pregnant. Everybody see? Sin always have casualties. Always. Nobody wins with it. Everybody understand? So look, you see what's happening here. David should have been the one crying and sad about it. We done lost the battle. We're not used to this. Not him. I have my own little secret war going on, and I just want it. At the expense of everybody else that died in that war. Everybody see? You see how sin is just na by nature selfish? So he's telling him, encourage, you know, telling the messenger, encourage him. Just, we'll do better next time. Let's go and keep reading. Verse 26, and when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. Everybody see? But let, let's read verse 27. And when the morning was past, in other words, sweet, are you over this yet? I know you love the man, but you know. He, you know, he should have been a better fighter. He's, he's, he's a stupid man. I called him home to go. He could have been at home with you. Oh, but good old Uriah, he always got to do what's right. <laughs> Holier than thou. See that? He was so heavenly minded. He was no earthly good. <laughs> uh, 
and all them other Negro spirituals that people like to sing when they wrong. Always trying to outdo somebody. He thought he was better than me anyway. So you done mourning for him? Let's read verse 27. And when the morning was passed, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became what? His wife, and bare him a son. But when it's all said and done, and we think we done got away with it, and finally, see, the devil was fighting me on this thing, but I knew that it eventually... I would get the victory in it. But the thing that David had done, what did it do? Displeased the Lord. <laughs> Isn't that something? What he had done, it displeased God. Isn't that something? Well, you know, this is where we make our mistakes at in time. We think God's silence is his approval. It is not. I can't tell you the number of times people over the years have come to me about what next move they should have, and I would say, no, that God don't want you to do that. They'll say, well, if, if, if everything opens up, if the door opens up for me, I just take that as God's approval. You know what that's like saying? If this woman here allow me to fornicate with her, I'll just take that as God's saying that this is who I'm supposed to be with. <laughs> Everybody understand? God is not moved by your witchcraft. God has one will for you. The devil got all kind of other doors around that will. And if it's in you to disobey God's will, then don't blame God for your desire to walk through all these other doors that the devil's got for you. We have to seek God's face for his will. And not think, well, the door's open, so, you know, I, got a, I, I had a best friend that's deceased this day. Because years ago, a false prophet told him he was supposed to move to a certain city. I told him, don't go there, it's a trap. Well, you know, you know if, if I get a job there, then I'm going to take, uh, it don't matter. The devil got all kind of jobs he can give you. Seek God's will. Well, this, this preacher that told me that he's older than you and more seasoned, okay, sir. He'll die for lying to you and you'll be right behind him. Well, you know, my wife and I, we trying to reconcile and she said if I move to this city and, and when I get established, she's going to follow. No, she won't. And she did not. When he moved and stayed there for a while, she filed for divorce. Everybody understand? A good friend of mine, dead. And the Lord showed me a few years ago that he was going to die with no children because he was outside of his will. He was my age, in his 40s. Died with no children. Everybody understand? Now here's the problem. People can live a few years in that disobedience. They can live a few years outside of God's will. They can join all kind of churches and, and do, do all of that. And the whole time deceived. Everybody understand? And he, yeah, he belonged to a church. He, he, he was doing all this stuff in church. It did not matter. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that a, a living dog is better than a dead lion. Everybody understand that proverb? You know naturally, so if the lion is alive and the two face off, the lion is going to whoop that dog every time. But if that dog is alive, he's better than a dead lion. 
Everybody see you. The devil knows that. Don't matter what you're doing, I'm about to kill you in a couple of years because you're outside of God's will. So we see the setup here. We're going to go, if you have your Bibles, let's go to the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. Is everybody there? We want to. All right, Brother Tanya. We want to go over a few things just real briefly. We're going to explain this as best as we can. I want you to take, a, take note of this timeline. Can everybody see the words clearly? This is a timeline from idleness to callousness. Everybody know what callous, what being callous means? It's like, you know what callous is all on your hands? That's when you've done something for so long. People, you know, even trumpet players, they can get calluses on their lips. That's when you had so much friction on your flesh in a certain area over over an amount of time, after a while, your skin hardens in that particular area of your body. And so what it does is it, it fixes it so that you don't you no longer feel the pain or have feelings in that particular area. It's God's way of protecting you naturally so. And so here, the first thing we read, the first um, verse that we read in chapter one, uh, in, in that chapter of Second Samuel was idleness. He was sent, he was supposed to go to war, but he refused. So the old people have this saying, idleness is the devil's workshop, and idle mind is the devil's playground. Everybody understand what idleness is? That's when you just ain't you're not doing anything. It's almost like you just looking for something. You just, you know, you know how many Teenage boys get in trouble because they ain't got nothing to do. They're just walking around looking for trouble. It's impossible to be idle when you're in God's will. You're going to be doing something. Everybody understand? So idleness, his idleness led to what? Lust. Standing on top of the roof there. If he'd have been at war, he wouldn't have been on his roof. He wouldn't have saw that woman taking a bath. Everybody understand? The lust led to what? Adultery. That was before they got in bed. He had done it in his heart. And eventually he, it manifested physically so. Everybody understand? The adultery led to deceit. Twice that we know of, he tried to trick the man, Uriah, into going home to sleep with his wife. He didn't do it sober, and then so David thought, well, surely drunk, he won't have control over himself. He'll go home and do it then. Still didn't do it. So the deceit led to murder. You, you give me no choice but to kill you. You won't do what I'm telling you to do. You see how it's everybody else's fault? <laughs> you should have, you're right, I'm the king. You should have just been going to sleep with your wife like I was trying to get you to do. Isn't that something? Uriah wasn't aware of, of David's plan. Murder led to callousness. In other words, indifference. The man is dead now. So are several of his military buddies. And, and, and David don't even have enough sense to weep for the people who have lost 
their loved ones in a war that he refused to go to. This, believe it or not, this, this last one, that's the most dangerous place to be. <coughs> Does everybody understand? Because when you callous, it, it, you'll do the rest of this and more. I don't have a heart. I don't, I, I don't even have enough sense to have feeling. When I worked in, uh, in television, I saw news reporters, and you, today you still see it, news reporters announcing, yeah, Bobo and them got shot on the corner. Yeah, you know, somebody got killed, somebody got robbed, somebody got raped. They reporting that. But don't you dare let a dog die. I think it's a shame we live in a country where dogs got more rights than people. Callous. I'm not, I don't even have, a, I can't even feel anymore. I done got so knee deep in sin, I, I don't even, it, what moves everybody else don't even move me. So what happens when a person is callous and that's mixed with selfishness, you're going to step on people and just tell them to get over it. You're going to make excuses for your behavior because in your mind, this is just the way I am. You need to just quit being so sensitive. Everybody understand? That person, they're going to do all kind of stuff. When they get to that point, they're going to do all kind of stuff. Now, what led, what happened in this journey? We know they, if David slept with Bathsheba and she, she felt like she was pregnant, we know at least a month passed because the Bible says she had just gotten off of her cycle. So how would she know she was pregnant? They didn't have pregnancy tests back then. She must have missed her cycle. And she might have given it another week before she had the heart to tell David, I'm, I'm pregnant. Time happened from idleness to callousness. Time is your enemy when you're at step one. Everybody understand? Everybody understand that? Time is your enemy. You don't have time to sit and sin. David, that Holy Spirit on the inside of him, he should have listened to it when it was nudging him. Go on to war. Go, go to war. That's all the Holy Spirit would have been saying. Go to war, David. This is the time when kings go to war. Go ahead and go. Nah, I'm just, I'm going to sit this one out. Okay. And the Holy Spirit ain't got nothing else to say until, I'm not pleased with you, there was a man, David, who had a little bitty sheep. You know the story if you read the next chapter. Everybody understand? So from that, from that to this, the Holy Spirit was quiet. That's what happens when you override that little voice that's telling you to do something you don't understand. Well, why is this such a big deal? Joab is strong enough. My army, I trained them well. Go, God be with y'all. It's, it's by his strength anyway. Go to war, David. Nah, I just, I, you know, you can just quit troubling me about that. I ain't got to go to every war. Haven't I done enough? Everybody see. Time is our enemy when we are in the mud of sin. You know, there's this old saying I used to hear growing up. Of course, I grew up having a horse, and I was always told if that horse ever buck you off of it, you get right back on. Why? Because the longer you stay off that horse, the more fearful you're going to get about getting back on it. And that's the way it is with sin. When it bucks you off of, uh, off of God, you get right back. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm getting back on. I'm, I'm straightening up. I ain't got time to sit here and, and, and think about what the horse did. I'm getting right back on. 
Why? Because when you sit, when you on the ground, you know, in that mud after you've been bucked off, then the devil start talking. Well, you know that horse, he ain't really trained. He ain't, he, you, you know, it's everybody else's fault. And then before you know it, you're here, still in the mud. Everybody understand? So time, it's important that we don't waste time. When you know you've been bucked off, get right back on. When you know you've done something wrong, you make it right, right away. Even just having a thought. The, the, one of the mistakes that believers make is undercover, they got things in their hearts. And they think, well, I'm hiding it and it's there, but nobody know about it. Let me make this clear. When you outside of God's will because of stuff in your heart, the devil's going to expose you. That's his job. He talked to you, get you in a certain mind frame, and then expose that mind frame. Everybody understand? So what stretch time? How, what stretch that? This might have happened over months. What stretch from idleness to callousness? What stretch time? P R R A I D E pride. I can't confess that I should have went to this war. I can't do that. Oh, okay. I now I can't confess that I was lusting after this woman. She she, she pretty. She should have been covered up. She should have closed the curtain or something. I can't confess that I slept with this man's wife. That's crazy. I'm going to cover it up. I can't confess that I got this man's wife pregnant. That's crazy. I'm going to make him think it's his. I can't confess that I've worked in deceit and I tried to set him up. I, I, I'm not going to do that. It's going to all work out. Why? Because all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's, that's Bible. I can't confess that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to all come out in the wash. <laughs> I can't confess that. I have nothing to do with that murder, really. That was on him. I didn't kill him. Everybody understand? You see the, the, the gradual downfall? Every time he refused to confess, it got worse and worse to the point where he no longer had feelings that a normal human being would have, not about himself. But when the prophet come to him about this little sheep that got killed, that somebody killed that had a bunch of his own sheep, where is this man? I, he, he deserved to die. Why? Because callousness make you see everybody but yourself. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is the devil's job from day one. This is the reason why he caused a lot of us to get in relationships we shouldn't have been in. It makes you callous when you get in the one you're supposed to be in. It makes you look cold-hearted towards your spouse. You don't even have enough feelings to cry anymore behind stuff. It makes you not even have a mindset to work something out. It's just going to all work out. If it don't, oh well. You see the pride there? So now are we at, you can turn the camera back. Are we at the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew? Let's go ahead and we're going to start reading at verse 21. It says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in, in danger of the judgment. Everybody see that? You know why he's saying that? 
Because he's trying to stop it at idleness. He's trying to stop it at the door. If you anger with somebody without a cause, you're already a murderer. It's going to get you to this point. You see how we have to check our little feelings before, it, before we wring somebody's neck? My mother, when, uh, when, I, when I was in the military, uh, she was a substitute teacher. And she, that, that, you know, she didn't stay in that career too long because the children of that day, which was, you know, maybe 20 years ago, that they were way different than my day. And my mother, you know, she talked about how these parents, they, they send their children to school in Jordan, you know, little third, she was uh, the third grade substitute teacher. And they all had little Jordans and Nike, you know, just all just dressed to the T. And my mother, you know, she was saying, now these ain't nothing but some well-dressed dummies. They don't even know how to add and subtract. Uh, but they, they got on $100 shoes. So one of, the, one of the little boys, he had a book on his desk, and he would just take the book and just drop it on the floor and then look at my mother. My mother would make him pick it up, and he, he'd just do it again, just take the book and drop it on the floor and then look at her. And my mother said before she knew it, she had that boy up against the wall with her hand around his neck. That was her last day. <laughs> she went and talked to the principal. Look, sir, that, this is not my calling. <laughs> I can't work here anymore. You know what it was? She stopped it at the door. Let me, let me find me another career before I end up in jail. No, I'm not going to jail behind these little... Nike wearing thugs, it, I'm not doing it. They not worth it. So that was her clue. Wait a minute, how did I end up up against this wall with this, with this boy's neck around my hand? How did you get your neck there? <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you for the signs. <laughs> You stop it at the door. <laughs> Last part of verse 22 says, And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in the danger, in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught, in other words, anything against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar. And go thy way. First, be reconciled. First, 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 be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Everybody understand? That's the name of this message, reconciliation. Time is of the essence. Verse 25, look at what it says. Agree with who? Thine adversary. How? Quickly. Does everybody understand? Agree with who? Thine adversary. Everybody understand? So this is saying to us, now let's bring it to us. What is this saying? If I, if, if, if I go to a brother or a sister, whoever, say, you know, I believe you have this issue. Now, this is what I've been observing. First thing you have to know is I ain't got nothing against you. I ain't got nothing against you. But if I see it, I'm going to call it out. So you can take me as your adversary. Well, you know, Brother Bowden said this, and I don't like it. But what did this Bible tell you to do? Agree. Yeah, Brother Bowden, you know, right now I might not say it, but if you saw it about me, I'm, 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 I'm going to change. That's what the Lord told us to do, agree. Everybody understand? Agree. Okay, I, everybody understand? People have brought me all kind of stuff, and I, I don't just come against it. The Bible says agree. 
with your adversary quickly. Why? Because if you don't do it quickly, you, you waste a few seconds of grin, you're going to talk yourself out of it. You're going to get bitter. You're going to get mad. Agree with that adversary how? Quickly. And then he goes more in detail. Whilst thou art in the way with him. In other words, when the situation is happening right then. You ain't got to go home and pray about it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to pray about it. Just, just give me, a, and, and then call a few days later after you done went through all these cycles of getting offended and up and down and up and down and up and down. Agree right away. That's how you stop the devil at the door. Does everybody understand? It's for husband and wife as well. When the husband comes to the wife with something, wife agree with it. And he's not your adversary. So if you're supposed to agree with your adversary, how much more so? Everybody understand? Agree. It's really that simple. And listen, let me make this clear what agree means. It don't mean, okay, so yeah, you, you, you might have a valid point. Because you know what the faking will do? If, if you agree with your mouth, in other words, you just, yeah, I'm not going to say nothing bad about it. You know, if the Lord, if you say the Lord gave you that word, I guess that, I ain't, I ain't got nothing to say about it. But in your heart, you was wrong for that. You came to me in the wrong spirit or whatever the case is. You going to remain the same individual. When you agree, your actions are going to change. Does everybody understand? So we're not talking about the fake stuff of I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to hold my peace. Just be glad that I'm saved. I'm sitting here listening to you. I'm going to hold my, I'm going to let you talk. You're older than me and I'm going to respect my elders. That ain't what the Bible say. Agree. Yes, sir. You've convinced me of this. If I agree, that means I believe what you're saying. Does everybody understand? It ain't just me, well, I'm, you know, I don't feel like fighting. The Lord done called me out of that. <laughs> Everybody understand? Why? Because when you agree, your actions are going to change. That means you believe what the other individual is saying. I believe that, so I, I agree, and I'm going to change. Agree with our adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. In other words, while you're having the conversation. There's no argument that should, should grow past midnight. There's no disagreement where, it, to me, if we disagree, we're going to stand right here until we work it out. That's why there's peace in my home. My wife and I, we don't go to bed with the devil. Well, if there's a disagreement, devil, you got to get out of here today, right now. No, we're not going to let you stay here. You here to cause confusion. Now you see what the problem is? Time. Well, you just stubborn and hard headed. Maybe the Lord will show you one day. That's a cancer. Who goes to the doctor and find out they got cancer? Tell the doctor, well, we'll wait. Let me pray about it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let this ride for another year. No, oh, I'm gonna be dead in another year if I don't start getting some kind of treatment for it. Everybody understand? If, if a doctor tell me I got cancer, that's my adversary. Now, I'd be a fool to sit there and say, no, I don't. No, I don't either. No, I don't. You didn't say that in the right spirit. Okay, doc, you the expert. I got cancer. What can we do to help? What can I do? Agree with your adversary while you're there. Everybody understand? You hear some news like that, you ain't got to go home and pray on it. You ain't got to, everybody understand. In this case, God is the expert. You ain't got to pray about what God said. He meant it. And this is, I believe, what the Lord is really trying to get us to see. When we stretch time, when we stretch 
agreeing with our adversary or whatever you want to call it. When there's a disagreement and we let it fester on, fester on, fester on, pretty soon the argument about authority turns into divorce. Nobody gets married on May 8th and then go get divorced on May 9th. When they get divorced a year, two, ten years later, is because they have stretched this timeline. They have lived a life of not agreeing. Everybody understand? And what you don't know is the devil is all in this timeline. When he gets you at the door, he's not satisfied with that. The Bible, Jesus said that, that the devil comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. Everybody understand? Steal, kill, and destroy. That is his M.O. He don't come, I just want to make you miserable. No, he's coming for your life. Everybody understand that? And not only your life, your children's life. You make bad decisions. You keep disagreeing and not coming to uh, coming together as one. You're going to be on this timeline. You cannot play with the devil with time. He's going to outlive you. And he's going to go on to, everybody understand? The same areas he was tempting our forefathers, our great, great, great grandparents, he's still the same devil. And some of that junk have even been passed on to us because they stretched time. And when they died off here, then he, he took up with us to continue that timeline. That's the reason why we can't play with him. You don't give the devil a day. No, devil, you're not spending the night here. You know what his response is? I am if you don't settle it. If you don't get that junk out of your heart, I'm going to be right here. I don't care. You can, you can walk around quoting scriptures and throwing all kind of olive oil on your door post. You just walk in unforgiveness. You just refuse to do what your Lord said to do. I got a right to be here when you disobey. Everybody understand? Now you understand what I said. The, the, the David couldn't help himself. When he refused to go to war, it was just open season on him. Everybody understand? Let's read verse 25. It says, Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Does everybody understand what that's saying? I'm going to share with you what that's saying, especially spiritually. So when David refused to do what he was supposed to do, to, and he could write off going to war, he was on his roof, he saw a woman, he wanted that woman, he slept with that woman. Everything was fine because nobody's going to find out. But the torment came when he got word that the woman was pregnant. If you read that story carefully, you can see De David is operating through torment. He's being tormented, trying to come up with ideas, trying to come up with plans to cover what he refused to, to deal with to begin with. Lord, forgive me for my disobedience. So from that point on, he was tormented. Everybody see that's what happens. Husband and wife, you argue, y'all just think, well, you know, we, my grandparents, they've been mad for 60 years. I put up with him. I put up with this old man. You know, I, we're gonna, we, ain't, we ain't never going to, we don't want anybody else. And the devil don't care. The Bible tells the husband to dwell joyfully with their wife of their youth. For that is your portion under the sun. Joyfully. Not being tormented. You ought to be happy you're married. Not just, well, you know, and I'm too old. Don't nobody want me. Don't nobody want her. I guess we'll just stay together. You know, that's the mindset of people. No, I'm going to be happy. And we're going to agree. We're going to enjoy our marriage. We're going to do what this word say. 
Everybody understand? We're not going to stretch this thing out. We're going to stop it at the door. Sweetheart, I'm sorry for saying that to you in the wrong way. I shouldn't have raised my voice. I shouldn't have, you know, I, I did that out of anger, and I was frustrated. Forgive me for doing that. And the devil said, okay, y'all won. Let me go back to my little cubby hole where I come from. But if you sitting there and you think, well, you know, that's my wife. I'm, I'm her authority. I ain't got to apologize. She should have listened. Everybody understand how it works? When you, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and tell you to do something, you better do it. I don't care how slight you think it is, how little you, to David it was a little thing. Joab is just as mighty as I am. He going to win this war. But he didn't see adultery and murder down the road. And of course you know the end of that story. Y'all know the end of the story? Jesus Christ. Well, why is that? Because when Nathan told him, okay, God, have, God forgive you of your sin, when he repented of that. But the sword will never leave your house. You know what that means? What he was saying was, your family members from, from this time, from this day forward, they're going to always be killed. Your offspring, they, murder is going to abide in your home. And what happened to Jesus Christ? He was killed. The son of who? David. Everybody understand? You think that didn't ring true to him every time somebody called him? Son of David, have mercy on me. You know what they were saying? Victim of murder because of what your forefather did. Have mercy on me. You're going to be killed. This is the reason why we as parents, we right now, we stop the devil at the door. Because when we're long gone, if the Lord tarries, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, they're going to have to deal with us the fact that we didn't stop it at the door. Everybody understand? They're going to have to deal with our sin that we've led into our homes. So it's best to just erase pride and quit stretching time. Okay, Lord, you showed me I was wrong today. I'm going to repent today. I ain't got to, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's a real thing. People have to build themselves up to repent. They have to make a case in their minds of, you know, was, was I wrong? Was I right? Okay, so what part did I play in that? Okay, well, yeah, I, I punched him in the face, but, you know, he shouldn't have been talking to me that way. Yeah, I did this, but they did that. No, if you played any part in it, agree with your adversary. Everybody understand? I'm telling you, you stop the devil at the door when you agree, when, when you're standing in front of each other. The worst thing you could do is go, quote unquote, cool off. Let's think about what really takes place when you're cooling off. Ain't, ain't no repentance going on. Ain't no, none of that. I ain't making it right with nobody when I'm cooling off. So who's there with the fan cooling you off? The devil. <laughs> Everybody understand? Calm down. I need for you to get calm. Handle this the right way. That, you know, he ain't worth, or she ain't worth going to jail over. Just calm down. Now, you want me to tell you what the danger of it is? The idea is, from the devil's mindset, when you have cooled down, in your mind, you think everything is right. But it ain't. He's still there. As long as you have not agreed, he's still there. He don't care how cool you are and how you speaking in tongues on Saturday or Sunday. I'm telling you, I've seen some cool devils. Everybody understand? Will cuss you out just as calm as they want to be. And, and everybody understand? And they think because they're calm with it, it ain't the devil, except it is. You just got a cool devil. Everybody understand? No, you ain't got to be a hothead to be full of the devil. No, you don't. You ain't got to be a hothead. You can be just as calm and cool. And that's the deceitfulness of it, though. You see that? You think, well, I'm in a good mood now. But what mood is your heart in? 
That's what you got to see. What mood is that heart in? You know why? Because if you don't make it right, that's, that's the reason why people keep repeating patterns. That's the reason why people keep getting angry. Because they think because they've cooled off it, it's done left them. It ain't gone. You got to do it God's way. That's the reason why married couples keep having the same arguments over and over again. They think because they done cooled off that they done moved on. You ain't moved on. Your heart is still there. We have to make it right. Everybody understand? I'm telling you, when I have a disagreement with my wife or whatever the case may be, it's going to be one time. We're going to settle it before we go to sleep. We, and we're not going to ever have this conversation ever again because it was settled. Everybody understand? That's God's will. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us plainly concerning your word. Lord, we pray that you will be merciful to us, Lord, if we've stepped out of your will in any capacity. Lord, if we have, we ask that you will reveal those things to us and help us, Lord. Help us not to get complacent. Help us not to be idle, Lord. Help us to get busy doing what you want us to do. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to lead and guide us. Help us to be sensitive to your word, Lord. Be sensitive to the moving of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to pay attention to that small, still voice. And when it tells us to do something, Lord, that we will not make excuses. Help us, Lord, not to procrastinate. Help us not to try to reason in our minds the things that your spirit is speaking to us, Lord. Help us just to be obedient. Lord, if there's anything in our life, according to what we've heard today, that's not lining up to your word, Lord, we pray that you will expose it. Bring it to our minds. Because, Lord, we know with time, we have the propensity to forget what opened the door to begin with. But Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would jog our memories. Help us, Lord, to be pure servants of you, to walk with our whole hearts in the fullness of your spirit so that you can be pleased with our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. We thank you all for being here today. And uh, if the law say the same, we'll all meet up uh, here just a little bit to discuss what we've heard. So if that's all now, you're dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.